I want to talk to you today about connecting with the poor. And here's what I want to discuss with you. You know what? I want to talk to you about types of poverty. I want to talk to you about why people are poor. I want to talk to you about some of the myths about poverty. And then I want to talk about how we as a church, you know what, can do the work of God of reaching out to the poor and the needy and those that need the Lord. You know, one of our commitments as a church, as God's people, is that we want to reach out to the world. We want to make a difference in the lives of the needy, of people in general. But we want to do more than just help the poor. We want to empower the poor. They take steps out of poverty into a life that God has designed for them. Because God has a better life. You know, poverty is a, is a big subject. And I don't want to minimize the complexities of poverty uh, in a 45-minute talk. I want, I, want to, I want to give you a little bit of background about poverty and about what it is. You know, sociologists have studied poverty at great length, not only in America, but around the world. And they tell us that there are six types of poverty, according to them. The first one is situational poverty. Now, situational poverty is a poverty that is usually temporary. And it occurs as a result of some disaster, maybe a divorce or a severe health problem. A good example of situational poverty caused by disaster is what we saw in New Orleans as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Or what we saw last month in the Bahamas as a result of Hurricane Dorian. It devastated, wiped out several islands of the 300 islands. Several were wiped out. Literally everything was lost. That's situational. They're poor. They don't have anything. And then there is what they call generational poverty. Generational poverty is a poverty that involves several generations who live in poverty. They're born into that situation. And usually people born into poverty, sometimes they, they don't have the tools to get themselves out of it. You know, there's this sense of hopelessness and helplessness in their lives. You know, they feel trapped with no way out. And they feel no one understands. And sometimes no one cares. And then the third type of poverty is called absolute poverty. You know, this type of poverty, we usually don't see it in the United States, but we're seeing more. It's becoming more common. But it is a poverty where people don't have even the basic necessities of life. Not only do they not have a roof, but they don't have clean water. They don't have food. You know, these people, their only focus is to survive one day at a time. And then there is what is called relative poverty. You know, relative poverty, this type of poverty is relative to the average standard of living in that person's society. For example, if a, if a family's income isn't enough to meet the average standard of living, they're considered to be relatively poor. You know, uh, American poor, by the way, when we look at it relatively, you know what, American poor would be very rich people in some countries of the world. Let me give you an example of relative poverty. It's, it's when your 14-year-old says, we're so poor, my parents can't even buy me an iPhone. Think about that. And they think they're poor. You know, according to the United States Census Bureau, the official poverty rate in the United States as of 2017 is this. 12.3% or close to 40 million Americans live in poverty as of 2017. And you say, well, how do they measure that? How do they determine what is poor? Well, if you are a family of four and you make a combined uh, income of less than 24300 a year, you are considered poor in America. And you qualify for the many government programs that exist to help the poor. And then there is another type of poverty called urban poverty. And this particular type of poverty is usually found in very large cities. You know, actually cities over 50,000, but definitely in cities of millions of people. And, and, and urban poverty is, is characterized by overcrowding. There's a lot of violence. You know, poor community health programs. And it's very difficult people who are suffering this type of, 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 of poverty to get any help. You know, in urban, in these areas... Uh, one of the other things that happens is that the schools are very bad. There's a lot of gangs and the crime rate is extremely high. And then there is what they call rural uh, poverty. You know, rural poverty usually occurs in, in cities of less than 50,000 people. And the low population limits services available for the people, so they struggle financially. You know, there's lack of job opportunities added to the problem. They can't get jobs. Now, poverty... Uh, Poverty has a tremendous effect upon people. You know, people that are poor, we know that they have more stress, more anxiety, and it causes a lot of issues in their life as a result of that. You know what? They have sometimes emotional issues, sometimes health problems, safety concerns. I want you to know that we know that poverty impacts people in a very powerful way. Worldwide, there are over 800 million people in the world 
or 11% of the world population is living in what the World Organization calls extreme poverty. And you say, well, what is extreme poverty? Extreme poverty is defined as people who are surviving on less than $2 a day, $1.96 to be exact. Now you say, wow, that's terrible. But actually, that's good news. Because in 1990, 35% of the world, or 1.8 billion people, were living in extreme poverty. You know, a lot has been done thanks to the church, thanks to organizations that are reaching out. Now, one of the questions as we talk about poverty that you've got to be asking yourself is, why are people poor? What causes poverty? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Let me give you a few. The first one is inadequate access to clean water and nutritious food. In other words, currently, we know that there are some 2 billion people in the world who don't have access to clean water at home. Let me say that again. 2 billion people that don't have access to clean water. In other words, they drink water infested with bacteria and all kinds of other diseases. You know, over 800 million around the world suffer from hunger. In other words, they don't have enough to eat to feed their families. And what this does is that it causes a lot of illnesses. You know, around the world, there is, you know what, anemia, scurvy, diarrhea, edema, Ebola, all kinds of things that we don't hear about here that much. But there are some countries of the world where that is common talk. It happens all the time. A lack of water, clean water, and food. The second reason why people are poor is because little or no access to livelihoods or jobs. What does that mean? In other words, without a job, if you can't make money, you can't buy food, you can't, you can't survive. Now, it's easy to, for us to assume that, well, listen, everybody that wants to work, they can. Well, that might be true in the United States, but that isn't true around the world. There are parts, third world countries, developing countries that don't have jobs even available if the people want it. In the United States also, you know, there are jobs. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a little bit. But the third reason is conflict or war. What causes poverty? Wars, conflict. You know, uh, in several ways, you know, large-scale violence like in Syria can grind, bring a, bring a society to a complete halt. You know, if you, if you think about what's happening in Syria, you know, infrastructure has been destroyed. People have been displaced. People are leaving. Literally millions of people are leaving Syria, leaving everything behind, everything just to be safe. It is believed today that 70% of the entire population of Syria now lives below the poverty line. At one time, extreme poverty was very rare in Syria. This is also true in Venezuela. This is also true in many countries. And sometimes here in the United States, we're sheltered and we have no clue. We think it's just the news, you know, promoting some to, to you know. But no, it is true. Another cause of poverty is inequality. What does that mean? In a lot of countries, there's not equal access to the resources needed to just, just keep a family out of poverty. Things don't trickle down to the common people, only the rich people. There, there's inequality. The fifth reason is poor education. You know, most of the extremely poor don't have an education. Why is that? Well, first of all, there's not schools in some of those places. You know what? The other reason is a lot of those kids, even if they wanted to send them to school, they can't. They need them to work. They need to help, you know, bring food and, and work the fields. And, 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 and they can't get an education. And it's a big problem. And then number six is climate change. You know, whether you believe in global warming or not, we know that the climate is changing. And we know that the climate has the power to push millions of people into poverty. And we know that's going to happen because it is happening. You say, well, what does that mean? That means that there is drought. In some places, there is flooding. You know, these storms are impacting communities that already live in poverty. And some of the, some of the uh, countries, a lot of people depend on farming. You know, they grow their own crops to eat and live. And the storms or the lack of water is causing that to diminish climate. And then number seven is lack of infrastructure. What does that mean? They have no roads. They have no bridges. They have no cell phones. They have no internet. In other words, they're isolated. They're living off the grid. Nobody knows about them. They have no way of communicating. They have no way of buying and selling and participating in the market, which could be, you know, many miles away. No infrastructure. And then number eight, of course, limited capacity of the government. What does that mean? It means that, you know, they don't have the social welfare programs that we have today. You know, in America, we call that a safety net. In America, the safety net helps people stay out of poverty. There's programs that help people make sure that they have food, make sure they have some type of medical care. 
But there's a lot of countries that have nothing like that. And what's happening is the people are, 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 are slipping further into extreme poverty like never before. And then you add to that ineffective or, or corrupt governments. They, they contribute to extreme poverty. We were really saddened many years ago when Somalia went through their civil war. And because of war, there was people dying. And literally thousands, millions of tons of food were being sent to them. You know, for, only for the government to take it and sell it in the black market and fill their pockets and never trickle down to the poor people. There's a lot of governments that are, that are corrupt and uh, they don't care about their people. And then number nine, lack of resources. In other words, people living in poverty don't have the means to weather the storms of life. So, you know, they have droughts, there's wars, there's illness, and there's little money saved or assets that they have that can help them. They, don't, they live day by day. Now, there's a couple of myths that I want to share with you about poverty. And the reason I included that today is because some of these myths are promoted by Christians. And before you promote any of these myths, you need to get the facts. And I say that lovingly and very carefully. Let me give you some. There's a whole bunch. But here's the first one. You know what? Uh, the, the most commonly held myths about poverty is poor people don't want to work. Listen, in the United States, we know today that, that 60% of adults living in poverty who are able to work do so. As a matter of fact, not only do they work, some of them hold two, three jobs because of a lack of, of education. The issue is not a willingness to work. What's an issue today in America is a lack of well-paying jobs. A lot of our good jobs have left America. Thank God they're coming back. Can I hear a good amen to that? So they want to work. And those that can, yeah, there are some that don't, but those are exceptions to the rule. You know, they're not. They're hardworking people that want, they want to take care of their families. Here's myth number two. The U.S. doesn't have much poverty. You know, after all, Pastor, we're the richest nation in the world. Well, listen to this. The truth is that the United States regularly ranks, you know what, at the bottom of developed, industrialized countries when it comes to adult and child poverty. We're one of the lowest. There is poverty around us. Here in Chino, you know what, in San Bernardino County, in California, in the United States. The third myth is that poverty doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, drug use is higher in poor communities. In other words, you know what, poor people, they're in that situation because they spend the little money they have on alcohol and drugs and cigarettes, you know, and that's why we're there where they're at. And I want you to know that's not true. We know for a fact that higher income people are more involved in drug use than the poor people. Irvine and Orange County, if you were to look at the statistics, they have a higher rate of drug abuse and use than they do in, in, in some of the parts of LA. The problem is the media focuses over here and they get away with nobody focusing on them. But they have some serious problems over here in Irvine and Tustin in those areas. They have more money. They can afford the good stuff. Well, there's no such thing as good stuff, but they can afford more. <laughs> Somebody say, Pastor, how do you know? No, I, I shouldn't have said that. The fourth myth is it doesn't concern me. Pastor, poverty doesn't concern me because I will never be poor. Now listen, 12% of Americans, according to our standards, live in poverty. But here's what you need to know. 40% of all of us will, want, will experience at least one year of poverty in our lifetime. One year. You know, some of you, I think last I heard 40, 45% of Americans live check by check. They miss one check, they're in trouble. Thank God for credit cards, amen. Thank God for good credit, amen. But listen, don't say it's not going to happen. It can happen to anybody. We saw it in 2008 as our economy took a dump. But I want you to remember something. As we talk about the poor, you know what? Poverty isn't a concept. Poverty is people. You know what? We're talking about people. And I want to remind you that Jesus loves people. He loves poor people. He loves middle class people. He loves the wealthy people. So the question that I want us to consider today is how do we empower those that are in need in a way that honors Christ? What would God want us to do? What is God's word? What, you know, what, what does it say about our role in ministering and connecting with the poor? Because they're there. It's a reality around us and around the world. There's no doubt. I hope I, I, I you know, destroy those ideas that there aren't. There's a whole bunch of them. So, you know, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, there's a lot that God has to say about his heart for the poor and how he wants his children, us, to show compassion to the poor and to the needy. There are expectations that are laid out in Scripture for God's people. For example, you know, God spoke to Moses and, and he told Moses, I want you to instruct the people about how they're supposed to treat the poor and the needy. 
And it's recorded for us in many places. But in Deuteronomy 15.10, notice what it says. It says, give generously to them. This is the poor. And do so without a grudging heart. And then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Notice, take care of them, minister to them, and I will bless you, says the Lord. Proverbs 14, 31 says, those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. Proverbs 21, 13 says, if a man shuts his ear to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Proverbs 28, 27 says, he who closes his eyes to the poor receives many curses. I hate that verse. Amen. But God has a lot, and that's just a few, about our responsibility and God's desire in the Old Testament for his people to reach out to the poor. How about the New Testament, Pastor? Well, you know, the New Testament is equally clear on how we're to take care and reach out to the needy and the poor. You know, first of all, giving to the poor was a significant part of the Lord's ministry. I mean, if you really pay attention, he ministered a lot to the poor. They're the ones that came. And then when you read the book of Acts, giving to the poor was a significant part of the ministry of the early church. Over there in Matthew 25, Jesus talking uh, on this subject, talking about his second coming, what's going to happen. We know this as the judgment of the the sheep and the goats. But notice what he said in, in verse 35 of Matthew 25. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And it says then they're going to, those that he's talking to, those that are his are going to say, verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did, you, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And notice what Jesus responds to them in verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In other words, Jesus says, you know, whenever you and I use what we have, what he's given us to empower someone who is needy or someone who doesn't have it, you're doing it as unto the Lord. That's how special it is. When you and I use what we have to make a difference in the world. It's not just a tax credit. It's not just something we do to help us at the beginning of the year with our income tax. No, it honors God. I, let me go back to the Old Testament. There's a scripture that, that I wanted to take a few minutes to just point out to you. Proverbs 19, verse 17. Notice what it says. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. And he will pay back what he has given. That's an amazing verse. Listen, listen to it. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. And he who, the Lord, will pay back whatever you've given. You know, the word pity is an interesting word in the Hebrew. Hanan. And it means to help, to show favor, to be gracious to. Notice, you lend to the Lord. Lend is the Hebrew word lava. And it means to join oneself to, to twine together, to unite You know, when you and I reach out to those in need, we're joining our lives, not with the poor. We're joining our lives to God, to Christ. You know what? Because that's what he came to do. You know, the Bible says that he emptied himself of his, you know what, of majesty and glory and humbled himself and took on flesh. And he identified and he united with the human race so that he could love and save the world. That's the concept. When you and I give, we're lending to the Lord. And what we're doing is we're uniting our life. It's not the poor. It's unto the Lord. It's unto God. You know, we're not going to say, the church doesn't say, hey, well, somebody should do something. No, we need to say, Lord, what can I do? Because the Lord calls us, the church, to be the hope of the world. To take the resources that he has put in our care, under our management, and use it to love and to reach out to the needy and to the poor and help them come to a place of wholeness. Now the question that is asked is how do we do this? How can we do this? All of us, I believe there's not a person here today that doesn't want to do something. The problem is many times we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. You know, many times our our hearts have become hardened because of the abuse. We know we've been, you know, taken advantage of. We've been conned. I remember when we were at the Chafer building there on Mountain and Chafer, this guy would show up at least twice a year in his motor home. 
and uh, he would go to the office and he says, hey, I'm out of gas. I need gas money. And uh, I was working full time, but the secretaries made the mistake of giving him some money. So every six months he'd come. And one day I was there. And they say, hey, this guy's been coming for years and we're actually afraid. So we give him 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. And I say, you shouldn't do that. So I come out and I say, hey, buddy, can I help? He goes, yeah, I, I, I motorhomes right there and I don't have gas and I need to get to wherever. I goes, how, how much, uh, how many miles a gallon do you get? Oh, I get about six, seven. It was an old one, six, seven miles a gallon. I go, can you afford it? He goes, no. I go, why do you have it? He goes, because that's all I have. Because he said, listen, by the way, that doesn't, that's not your concern. I need some money. And I said, well, buddy, listen, I love you. God loves you, but I'm not going to give you any money. He looked at me and said, what kind of church is this? What kind of pastor are you? What kind of Christians come to this church? And you know, what he was telling me is that, you know, Christians, we have to be foolish and little ignorant and little dumb and, you know, what not ask questions. And I want you to know that's not the case. You know, we need to know what we're given to and we need to invest wisely. But I tell you that story to tell you sometimes our hearts have become hardened because of the ab abuse and advantage. By the way, do you think that did that not happen to Jesus? Let me suggest to you, it was no different in the ministry of Jesus. You know, a lot of people showed up to the ministry of Jesus just to eat. Free lunch, I'll be there. Amen. <laughs> do you really believe the poor that Jesus helped immediately became responsible, got it together? I don't think so. Do you really believe that those prostitutes that Jesus touched, all of them forsook their trade and all of them got it together? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I know so. I know so. Do you really think that all the people that were healed were really grateful and thankful and turned their lives around? No. The Bible tells us of a story where Jesus heals 10 lepers and only one comes back and is thankful. What do you think happened to the other nine? They went on and didn't care one bit. They got healed, they got what they needed, they got theirs, and they're on. And I suggest to you that that illustrates the general response that we can expect also. Listen, yes, there will be people that would abuse, that take advantage. There will be people that don't need, you know what, us to love them and have compassion on them, and they would abuse it, and never will they get a glimpse, even though we tell them that there's a greater hope. But we still have compassion and love people. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. You know, talking about the poor... Uh, st studies and surveys have, have been done to look really at, at them. As a matter of fact, surveys have been done in third world countries or developing countries among the poor, asking the poor, you know, what? Well, tell us about what is your idea? What are you thinking? You're poor, you're without, what's going on in your minds? And you know what they say? They never talk about, I need more clothes, more food. They never talk about that. You know what they talk about? They talk about what's going on inside. And you know what's going on inside of them? There's a, there's a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. There's a sense of shame. There's a sense of we're not whole, we're lacking. There's a sense of we're trapped. It's not I need a better car, I need a better house, I need better clothes, I need better shoes. It's, it's not that. It's a, you know what, I, I, inside I feel inadequate. You know, I, I don't have access to education. I don't have access to anything. I just want to feed my family. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of feeling. You know, and sometimes that's important because we approach it a little different. Well, if we just give them this... That's all. They'll be, they'll, be be, they'll be better. No, no, I'll tell you, our job and our challenge as a church is to give them more than food and shoes and clothes. It's to move them from a sense of helplessness, a, a, a sense of hopelessness to a sense of hope. Things can be better. Help them believe, you know what, you can get out of this situation you're in. We serve a big God that will help you, that is with you. But sometimes we North Americans, we people from the United States, we think we know better. And sometimes we think a handout, listen, a handout's not going to meet their hopelessness and helplessness. It's going to help their immediate need. But what they need is more than that. And I want to suggest to you that sometimes our good intentions really don't help. They hurt. Because what we tell them is, you're not capable. You can't. We're going to come and we're going to help you because without us, you cannot do it. And I suggest to you, that is an insult. It's an insult. So I want you to think with me today, you know, poverty, really all poverty is a result of brokenness. You know what? All of us are poor. All of us are broken in some way. You know, everything people face is a result. The root of it is brokenness. And you say, what do you mean? Well, first of all, you know what? It starts with the broken relationship with God. 
You know what Adam and Eve did when they sinned is that, you know what, relationship was broken. There was a, there's distance. You know what, it affected their relationship with God. And there's a lot of people with that hope. And I tell you where hope starts is when they reestablish and come to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts there. That's behind everything that we do. Jesus is the only answer to brokenness. The second thing I mean is they're not only are they broken, a broken relationship with God, they're broken with their self. You know, you listen to them, you talk to them, and they say, I don't feel like I have what it takes to better myself, to better my family. You know what? I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. I can never get out of this. They don't, you know, once you come to Christ, the first thing that should happen is you should see yourself the way Christ sees you. And he sees you as overcomer of getting out of the hole. He'll help you out of the hole. Amen. But people that have broken relationship, they're broken with themselves. And then, of course, they're broken in their relationship with others. In other words, when, when you have bad relationships with other people, you're afraid to ask for help. You can't ask for help. You know what? And, and sometimes we want to help, but because we don't like them, we don't help them. Or we have these ideas about them. So relationships with God, with broken with self and broken with others. You know, Jesus addressed that. He comes into Nazareth, the town where he was raised. And the Bible says he comes to the synagogue. And as he gets there, he's given the scroll and he opens it to Isaiah. Luke tells us in chapter 4 and verse 18 on that this is what he read. Notice what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, in your sight. Now you ask, what was Jesus saying? Well, Jesus was saying what we say, that he came to bring good news to the poor, to set the prisoner free. Jesus is the one who can bind up the brokenhearted brokenness in our lives. You know, the word poor is the word, you know what, in the Greek there, tohas, and it refers to those reduced to begging, to helplessness, to powerlessness. You know, they can't do anything. Jesus said, I came to help them. Brokenhearted is a word that means those whose lives are shattered, crushed, broken into pieces. Jesus said, I am the answer to brokenness. By the way, that changes how we help people who are in need. It affects how we see the answer and the solution. So how do we help? in a way to minister to the needy, to the poor, in our community, around the world, in a way that helps them and doesn't hurt them. Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts. Here's number one, thought number one. You know what? God calls his children to serve others, not save others. Well, Pastor, I thought our job was to save people. Do you really believe you can save people? No, no, we serve them in the name of Jesus. And when they see Christ in us, they ask, why do you do it? What helped you? And then we point them, you know what, to Christ. And we tell them, I tell you what, this is, this is just temporary relief. You know, you're asking what you need is, you need a change inside. And only Jesus can do that. Listen, we're not the answer. Jesus is the answer. But you know why I tell you this? Sometimes we go in there, we're, we're going to solve all these people's problems. No, we're not. Jesus is going to solve their problems. You know, and, and how do we do that? How do we serve others and not save others? Well, there's two things. We offer relief and we offer restoration. Now, what is relief? Relief is temporary, immediate temporary help during and after a crisis. It's immediate help. You know, recently, Dorian hit the Bahamas. Islands were literally flattened. 40 hours, the storm hovered over them. 180 mile per hour, you know what, winds, 40 inches of rain, 20 foot, for, uh, foot storm surges, category five storm, 50 dead, thousands, you know what, missing. All of them homeless. I want you to know on your behalf, we send a check to our organization that was on the ground the next day. $3,000 and says, we want to help. We want to give them relief. We know they need water. We need them to help. And we did that in your name. There's a video that I want you to see. Check it out. It's very short. Notice Convoy of Hope. Check it out. Hi, this is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope. And with your help, we are aggressively responding to the disaster in the Bahamas. Immediately after Hurricane Dorian hit, I want you to know we had relief workers on the ground and containers filled with food, water filters, and emergency supplies. Friends, I want you to know this is an urgent situation. I've been to disasters all over the world, and this is one of the hardest hit I've ever seen. 
We, we were one of the few organizations who were given permission to fly loads of emergency supplies right into the hardest hit areas. And thus far, we've delivered 30 plane loads. That means to date, we have distributed more than 100,000 meals, along with clean water, tarps, ready to eat food items, hygiene kits, diapers, generators, and more. But please understand, this is just the beginning. In disasters like this, dehydration and disease become major concerns. But with your help, you can count on us to be there in the Bahamas over the long haul. Long after the news cameras have stopped rolling, we're going to be there meeting needs and helping people put their lives back together. So thank you so much for your trust and your support. Thank you for your compassion and your love for the people of the Bahamas. Amen. Give yourself a hand clap. You guys helped you make that possible. As a matter of fact, I was really proud of our organization because I got an email this week. To all, they said that all to all the pastors. They said, pastors, you don't have to give anymore. More than enough came in to help the, the relief there of the Bahamas. There's still some, some other work to be done, but thank you so much. No more. Don't give anymore. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's amazing. That's relief. And then, of course, we, we reach out to them to, with restoration. Restoration is a long-term relationship to rebuild wholeness. You know, like he said, the, the news will be there, but after four or five days, they're gone. When's the last time you heard about the Bahamas in the last week? You know what? They're, they move on to the next exciting story. But there's going to be people that need to rebuild. And I'll tell you who's going to stay there. The church, Christians, organizations. You know what? Ministries, churches sending teams over there to help rebuild. You know, that's restoration. And that's how we reach out to people. That's how, that's how we do the work of the Lord that God has called us to do. We're called to serve, not to save other people. And in seeing our service, hopefully, hopefully they'll see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a story in the Bible. You know it, the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. That's what he did. He's walking along and he sees this guy that's been beaten close to that far from death. And he stops and he gives him relief. You know, gets some of his oil and, and helps him with his wounds, bandages his wounds, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the inn and tells the innkeeper, listen, restore this guy. Take care of him. Get him back to health. And listen, when I come back, you know what? I'll take care of the bill. It doesn't matter what it's going to cost. That is release, relief and restoration, you know what, in action. And that is what God has called us to do as we reach out to the needy and those who need our help. Can I hear a good amen to that? Yes. And that's what we've been asking you to pray about. You know, what, what, what would God want you to do? What is our responsibility as a church? What's my responsibility as an individual? You know, what, how can I, what do I need to do to make that happen? It might mean you give up a Starbucks once a month. It might mean you give up a dinner. It might, whatever it may mean. But I'll tell you what, it's worth it because we're sharing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've committed to partner with those who are doing relief and restoration work. And uh, thank God for those that are doing it. Here's the second thing that I want to tell you. God has called us to relate to people, not to rescue people. You know what, our, our efforts are not to rescue people, it's to relate to them. You know, the Bible calls us to love them, to care for them. You know, those that are struggling are not projects that you and I need to help. They're people that we need to love. They need our compassion. You know, we use three words, and sometimes we use them interchangeably, but they're not the same. Empathy is one of those words, and it means that you feel what a person is feeling. And usually people who can empathize are people who've gone through that same thing. In other words, they say, I get it. I get it because I've been there. I know what it is. That's empathy. And then we use the word sympathy. Sympathy means I can understand or I can try to understand what you're feeling, but really I've never been through it. And then there's the word compassion. Compassion is none of those. It's not empathy. It's not sympathy. Compassion is a willingness to relieve the suffering of another. Compassion is love in action. Compassion says, you know what? I've never been there. I might not even be able to understand what you're going through, but I'm a Christian and I love God with all of my life and I'm to reach out to the needy and I'm going to do something about it. That's compassion. And that's what God has called us to do. Have compassion. And the way we do it is by relating to people. You know what? Getting to know them. I have found that we are more effective when we understand them. Because sometimes we don't. You know, if you know, there, you, you might know a 25-year-old guy who's homeless and, and you know what, and struggling. And, and you'll go give him, take him to McDonald's, buy some food, or give him a voucher for a hotel night. But if you sit down and talk to him, you know what he might tell you? You know what my problem is? I don't know how to read. And as a result, I can't get a job. No one wants to hire me. 
You know what you need? He doesn't need a coupon to McDonald's. He needs somebody to understand and get him enrolled in a school where he can learn how to read. Amen? Maybe you know somebody who says, you know, I, I got this monkey, this gorilla on my back. It's drugs. And I can just get off drugs and, 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 and think a little clearer. You know what? I might be able to get my life together. They don't need food, even though we'll give them food. They need us to get them into a, a program and channel them somewhere where they can get some help and get their lives together. Maybe there's this single mom that is working hard and not making ends meet. You know what? And, and if you listen to her and relate to her, she says, you know what? I don't have transportation. I'm working, but I got a minimum wage job. You know, I know that if I had a, a car or some wheels, I can travel 10, 15 miles and I can make more money, twice as much money. You know what? Or a little bit more, but I don't have any transportation. You know what they need? They need a car. They need somebody to say, well, let's see what we can do. Let's see, let's see what, 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 how we can put things together. But here's what happens. Sometimes we Christians, we want to be heroes. And sometimes that doesn't really help. God hasn't called you to be a hero or rescue people. He's called you to reach out to them and relate to them and minister to them. Listen, God doesn't want us to do for somebody else what they can do for themselves. What we need to do is we need to help them with hope. You know what? And restoration. A sense of, of, of moving forward, of dignity. And that's not done with the handout. That's done with relating to them. And then the third thing, we're called to reach out, never to reach down. You say, well, what's the difference? You know what? Reach out. When we reach down, we're telling them, I'm better. You know what? You're down here. And uh, you know what? I'm better than you. Sometimes if we're not careful, we come off as a little proudful, pompous. You know, I can, you can't. I'm going to do for you what you can't do. We're never reaching down because we're not better than them. How many of you know I'm poor too? How many of you know we're all fellow strugglers? How many of you know we don't all have, I don't always have all the answers. But we're reaching out simply because God has asked us, because we love you and we care, because God has called his children to love and care. So here's the truth. We offer help, but we need help. All of us are poor. By the way, there's nothing wrong with being poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a poverty, a recognition in our part that I don't have what it takes. I'm not all together. I need God's help. You know, one of the things that we have committed to, and I'm going to end with this, we have committed to uh, partner with people that are doing it, not reinvent the wheel. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you heard from One Light that does outreaches, and we're partnering with them. You know what? We're partnering with Isaiah's Rock, and I want you to see a, a little uh, thing about her. She is led by a Charlene King, amazing woman of God here in Chino that's reaching out, you know what, to the needy at all times, back to school, Christmas, Easter, opens her home for hopeless. You know what? And we partner with her, and we support that ministry because we believe in it. Also, we're partnering with Food for Life, you know what, a, a feeding ministry, and uh, founded by uh, Alan Cindy Vandensteegs. Several of our, our church members are our board members. And together we partner with them to feed the needy. And are here and in other places, not only in Chino, but in Pomona or wherever they're at. We're partnering with them. We're not trying to invent the wheel. You know what God's word says that we are to love God with all of our heart, our mind, soul, and our strength. And then he said, and we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know what? We have poor neighbors next door. We have poor neighbors across the ocean. We have poor neighbors below us. And God has called us, love them the way we love ourselves. That's getting outside of our four walls. That is connecting with the poor. And that's why we have asked you pray and, and think about how you can help by going, by reaching out here. And, but let's follow this. You know what? Let's, let's serve them. Let's relate to them. You know what? Let's reach out to them. Not come off like we're heroes and we're going to solve all your problems because we can't. But we know someone who can. The same one that solved your problem. The same one that turned your life around. The same one that made a difference in your life can make a difference in their lives. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to pray with you as our worship team comes up. Father, we ask that you would empower us as your church to get this right. Lord, in our communities and all around the world. Lord, we don't just want to react to needs in a way that doesn't help. Lord, we don't want to come off as heroes or rescuers, because there's only one hero, one that can rescue, and that's you. Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to care. See needs around us. Make us as your church, Lord, as you said, the salt and the light of the world. 
Shining the light of Jesus, meeting physical needs, spiritual needs, and doing it all in the name of the one who met our needs, Jesus. Father, help us to share Jesus in a very practical way that people would say yes to him. Lord, and you would minister to them. Help them to step out of poverty. Help them to realize, Lord, that they have the power of the Holy Spirit once they come to you to step into their divine potential. You know what? And it's a process. But Lord, a lot of them don't believe that they're capable of that process. Help us to communicate that to them, Lord. And Father, we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? You know, as we were talking about poverty, there's all kinds of poverties. You know, a poverty that's very real out there is what we call spiritual poverty. As a matter of fact, spiritual poverty is probably one of the, the, the hardest conditions of the heart. And that's where spiritually, you're not doing well. If I was to ask you today, how are you doing spiritually? Some of you would say, not well. Some of you would say, you know what? I'm dead spiritually. Spiritually, there's no life. You know what, I'm doing well out here. I got cars, I got houses, I got everything I need. But in here, I'm dying. And you know what you're describing? You're, called, you're, you're describing, you know what, a poverty of the spirit. That's not good. That one is bad. And we're here to tell you that there's good news. Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it in abundance. There's only one answer to that emptiness, to that hole in your heart. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that 2,000 years ago, he came and he took your sin he took your punishment. He took the wrath of God that sinners deserved. And he took it upon his body so that you could experience life and forgiveness of sins and hope. The Bible says he was born and he came and he was buried, but he resurrected. And he's alive today. And because he's alive, there's nothing too hard. You know, when we come to church, we don't come to, to worship a dead Christ. He's a living Christ. He's alive and well. And we believe we need to be alive and well. Can I hear a good amen to that? So they're going to sing a song. We're going to open our altars so that someone can pray with you. And if you're here today and you know what? There's poverty. You're, you're, you're dying inside. There is the answer. There's hope. You're not hopeless. You might think you are. There's Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and God has touched your heart. Or there are other issues going on and you say, Pastor, I need prayer. Well, we believe there's power in prayer. We believe we serve a miracle working God. We don't believe that what he did stopped when he died or the, the apostles died. We believe that what he did back then, he continues to do today. I've experienced it. You have. So they're going to sing a song. Altar workers are going to come. They're going to stand here. And why don't you step out of your seat? They're going to pray with you. We believe there is power in prayer. Come in Jesus' name as they sing this song. Come. Come in Jesus' name.